The December 2016 issue of the American Interest Policy Journal warns that we will soon enter the age of bioengineered viral pandemics and collapse. Many experts say natural or bioengineered viral pandemics are inevitable due to new technologies that make it easy to modify DNA of an existing virus, making it more lethal or transmissible. Whether created and released by a terrorist group or one dedicated individual, a bioengineered virus could cause both the pandemic and, as people react, a collapse in economic activity and loss of law and order. This video explains the pandemic and collapse threat and outlines measures you need to take to prepare. I'm Dr. Drew Miller, Director of Advanced Analysis Applications. I'm an Air Force Academy Honor Graduate with a Master's Degree and PhD from Harvard University. I served in the Senior Executive Service in the Pentagon and in the top Department of Defense think tank, and currently run a consulting firm that conducts comprehensive risk assessments, business strategy war games, and helps organizations design robust, cost-effective risk mitigation measures. This is from the Brookings Institute, one of the most respected think tanks in the world, describing how a single individual can create a deadly bioengineered virus and release it. For new bioengineered viruses, there will likely be no immunity or treatment. We have already had some bioengineered deadly viruses. In 2001, Australian researchers attempting to make a contraceptive vaccine for pest control inserted a good gene into mousepox virus and accidentally created a lethal new virus. It could be an accidental release that leads to a bioengineered pandemic, a lunatic, a terrorist, or a nation state that de develops not just a deadly virus, but a vaccine for it and uses it in a secret biological attack. In 2010, researchers for the first time were able to design and produce cells that do not exist in nature without using pre-existing biological matter, the latest evolution in the rapidly advancing field of synthetic biology. DNA manipulation technology like CRISPR enables a small group or even an individual to much more easily create tailored, genetically modified organisms. Through bioengineering, a lone terrorist or a revolutionary guards lab in Iran can create a human-to-human -human transmissible version of avian flu. Dr. Tara O'Toole, former director of Johns Hopkins University Center for Civilian Biodefense Strategies, warned in congressional testimony that we are in the midst of a bioscientific revolution that will make building and using biological weapons even more deadly and increasingly easy. You don't have to use advanced technology to create a new lethal virus. Studies have been published that describe simple steps to modify avian flu, a very lethal virus, into a potentially human-to-human -human transmissible form that experts have warned could kill a billion people. When I tell people that there is a do-it-yourself bio site and thousands of people doing DNA manipulation and bioengineering experiments in their garages, most people don't believe me. But it's true, there are biohackers and many good intentioned people trying to develop cures for some disease, but some are likely unibomber lunatics and terrorists. While Ebola caused great harm, it is not very contagious. Its low transmissibility limits its ability to cause a pandemic. Avian influenza, on the other hand, which we know has been modified in labs to be air transmissible in some mammals, could yield the worst pandemic mankind has experienced. The worst threat is a deliberately bioengineered virus that Iran or North Korea or a terrorist group creates with the combination of high lethality and transmissibility plus a period when infected people are contagious before their symptoms show so victims spread the virus for a few days before they get sick and show obvious symptoms, unknowingly spreading the virus everywhere. Compared to a nuclear weapon, a bioengineered virus could kill far more people and not threaten the attacking group since we probably couldn't detect or prove who released the virus, and they might develop a vaccine before they release it in case it spreads back to their nation. The calculations shown here illustrate how a small terrorist group, in this case 30 Iranian Revolutionary Guard volunteers, spread a bioengineered virus in U.S. airports that, like smallpox, yields infected people who are not sick and showing symptoms for a few days, so they also spread it. While the Center for Disease Control will quickly detect a pandemic when infected people show up at doctor's offices, in this example, it will be far too late. Five million Americans would be infected and the virus would be present in probably every state and major city and perhaps most towns as well. Quarantine will be impossible at this point. The pandemic will be unstoppable and we will experience the worst disaster and loss of life in our history.
A pandemic is coming, inevitable as many experts report, and yet the nation is not preparing for it or even talking about it. Nassim Taleb wrote a brilliant book, The Black Swan, The Impact of the Highly Improbable, that explains why these warnings are ignored. We consistently ignore threats of really bad events that we've not experienced before. In his best-selling book, Taleb explains how standard risk management practices, along with common thinking errors and organizational behaviors, make us suckers for black swan disasters. There are lots of warnings of a bioengineered pandemic coming, but because it's never happened before, people foolishly think it's a low probability event. That is absolute nonsense. It is an uncomputable event. We can't compute a probability of an event due to new technologies with no past experience. But the impacts of new technologies like bioengineered viruses are very predictable, and the probability of a bioengineered viral pandemic is not low. Scientists and biologists have been warning about an inevitable pandemic, and Taleb himself has also warned of this pending black swan disaster. Taleb wrote that, quote, things have a bias to appear more stable and less risky in the past, leading us to surprises. The history of epidemics narrowly studied does not suggest the risks of the great plague to come that will dominate the planet, unquote. What Taleb recommends is to identify the full range of feasible disasters and focus on the consequences, that is, to evaluate the possible impact of extreme events. Trying to guesstimate a probability of occurrence is a waste of time, and assuming the probability is low is a deadly mistake. While it is impossible to calculate the likelihood of a pandemic or the reaction that will occur, reason and many past examples suggest that we will not just suffer deaths from the virus, but perhaps even more deaths from a collapse in economic activity and loss of law and order. The definition of collapse I use is shown here, along with the definition of an existential threat. Many experts who have warned of pandemics have reasoned that a viral pandemic could kill most of our population and set civilization back for many generations. Our just-in-time delivery economy is extremely vulnerable to disruptions. Taleb and a host of experts have warned that we have built a very fragile economic system. Not just businesses, but hospitals have just-in-time delivery of supplies, sourcing from lowest-cost providers on the other side of the world. Panic buying and hoarding will occur, and many gang members and normal people will start stealing food and essential supplies. Thus, when a pandemic hits, law and order may quickly vanish in many cities and eventually in wide areas. When the availability of food and water is threatened, widespread marauding will occur. In 1977, New York City suffered a lightning strike that caused a power failure for one night. Over 3,000 arrests were made for looting, 400 policemen were injured, and 500 fires were started. In a pandemic, the government will tell people to stay home to avoid catching the virus. Food and delivery vehicle drivers will quickly figure out that they risk being killed by exposing themselves to the virus or getting shot by marauders out stealing food. After Hurricane Katrina, looting spread rapidly through New Orleans, often in broad daylight and in the presence of police officers. One third of the city's police officers deserted their posts. The ensuing violence scared truck drivers with many refusing to go into New Orleans without military escort. A pandemic will be orders of magnitude worse. While it's normally a big electricity outage or disaster that triggers a collapse and loss of law and order, there are so many bad people nowadays that thousands of people can riot and maraud and kill people without any cause. This is what happened in cities across the United Kingdom in 2011, with four nights of looting, arson, attacks on police, and murders for no reason. We have flash mobs in the United States today where people use social media to assemble a big crowd to overwhelm a store and shoplift with impunity. It happens so regularly today that it doesn't get much media attention. So what should we expect in the event of a far worse, deadly viral pandemic? Pandemonium, collapse, and widespread, long-lasting lawlessness. Food stores will probably be sold out or looted within the first few hours of news of a spreading deadly virus. It will take half a year to develop a vaccine for a new virus, and only a small percent of the population will initially receive treatment. Many people won't accept their families starving or dying while they wait their turn. Food truck drivers won't risk working with the threats of either catching the virus or being killed by marauders. Even people with the courage to face the risk of catching the virus may change their mind when they realize they could bring a fatal virus home to infect their families. Those that do keep working, medics, firefighters, and police, are likely to soon be sick or dead. 
we should expect that most economic activity, public services, production of essential goods, and transportation will cease. Law and order may vanish in large areas for long periods of time. While I've given lots of briefings on the pandemic and EMP threats and other disasters that could trigger a collapse, as Talip explained, people overwhelmingly just ignore black swan risks. So to help make individuals aware of this threat and the vital need to prepare, I wrote this novel, Rohan Nation, that describes the aftermath of a bioengineered viral pandemic and the collapse that results and lasts for years. The book Rohan Nation, Reinventing America After the 2020 Collapse, gives a realistic description of how the struggle could play out describing a community of survivors in Colorado who are still struggling with collapse threats three years after the pandemic first hits. While this briefing has focused on pandemics, there are other disasters like an electromagnetic pulse solar event or a high-altitude nuclear detonation that could destroy our electric grid for over a year and trigger a collapse. We face these six major trends that make us far more likely to experience an economic collapse and long-term loss of law and order. Our highly crowded, urbanized world is dependent on daily shipments of food and functioning water systems and police forces. Our economic system is fragile, our urban population is dependent, and especially in cities, we have large numbers of gangs and well-armed bad people. Some are just waiting for an excuse to loot and maraud, and in a pandemic or a long-term electrical outage where people are legitimately concerned that they don't have food and water to survive, many otherwise law-abiding people will also kill if necessary to survive. So when you put this all together, the conclusion I reach is at odds with the common view that we face no serious threats. The destructive power of an individual has grown so high that a lunatic unibomber or a terrorist group or North Korean agents could release a bioengineered virus that, along with our fragile economy and dependent vulnerable population, we would not be able to deal with. The collapse in the economy, food shipments, and loss of law and order could lead to devastation most Americans can't imagine. The good news I can offer you is that there are a lot of very simple and largely low-cost preparations that can reduce your vulnerability to a pandemic and collapse. The rest of this briefing focuses on preparations that can greatly improve your odds of survival. Warren and Buffett insists that the CEO should regard his position number one as the chief risk officer. Now you have a lot of other functions too, but you should wake up every morning and think about, is this place built to take everything? This is the need to prepare for pandemics and other disasters, assuming a collapse of the economy and loss of law and order. Assume you'll be on your own for security and assistance. When was the last time your company compared the benefit of reduced investment in inventory to the cost of lost sales from supply chain disruption? Do you have plans to protect your associates at home as well as at the workplace from a pandemic, from loss of law and order? Can your organization find local suppliers, new services and products to offer when a collapse hits to retain value, keep operating, and improve your chances of survival? Many clients are surprised to discover that there are often single points of failure vulnerabilities in their supply chain. Knowing this, you might develop an alternative source, require the supplier to generate redundancy, stockpile this part, or require suppliers to warehouse a minimum amount in a reliable location. Local sourcing, even when more expensive, may be better. Highly complex processes that cannot be sustained without specialists and unreliable suppliers should be reconsidered. Flexible, more sustainable forms of operations that are costly and uncompetitive in normal times may be the only way to keep operating during a period of collapse. Low-tech production systems should not be abandoned and sold off, but warehoused for emergency use. The ability to keep operating or recover faster than competitors can yield huge payoffs. But in some scenarios, you probably are better off shutting down, securing your facilities with a program in place to safeguard your assets and protect your people. The first thing you need to do if your organization has a formal enterprise risk management or business continuity plan is to throw out the standard risk assessment matrix. It is widely used and seems to make sense, but it makes you a sucker for black swan events since people always assume that something that hasn't happened before must rate as low probability and is thus ignored. Identify critical risks to your organization and deal with them. Do not ignore threats from new technologies and changing situations that obviously cannot be reflected in historic statistics. 
The most valuable tool we use for risk assessment is this multi-criteria decision analysis scorecard that allows us to compare a variety of risk mitigation measures against a broad array of threats, consider all the relevant criteria, including our vulnerabilities, costs of mitigation measures, and other factors. You enter risk mitigation options in rows, and in the columns you enter a wide variety of criteria to consider, including how well different risk mitigation measures address multiple threats and disaster recovery capabilities you need, how expensive they are, and how easy or difficult to implement. A3 consultants can work with your staff to gather and estimate the information needed, select criteria relevant to your situation, assess different risk mitigation measures, and use the multi-criteria decision analysis tool to identify the most cost-effective set of risk mitigation measures. In general, what we look for are risk mitigation and disaster response capabilities that are broadly useful and effective at minimum cost. I made a presentation on assessing black swan risks and identifying cost-effective risk mitigation measures at the 2016 National Conference of Business Continuity and Disaster Response Planners. A3 has done supply chain vulnerability analysis in a variety of industries. You do not have to analyze every possible disaster event in detail. Instead, we can show you how to identify a broad range of feasible threats and their consequences group the common impacts and effects, then look for risk mitigation measures you can prepare to deal with the full scope of threats and impacts most effectively. Our risk assessment methodology, consulting, and our cost-effective risk mitigation development software makes this comprehensive analysis feasible and affordable. Our software and the methodology for enterprise risk assessment and management is a very disciplined analytic approach. We can train your staff to use our software tool in a few hours. It looks difficult and complicated, but we teach our clients techniques to make complex analysis understandable in a very coherent, convincing, and credible presentation. Our clients report that this is the most important tool for supply chain risk assessment and enterprise risk management they've ever used. It helps you identify, modify, and improve, and then select the most cost-effective risk mitigation methods that cover a wide range of risks at lower costs. It's an extremely flexible, effective tool to help show decision makers not just all the information, but demonstrate that you really have considered implementation issues and costs, and that it's not just a spending wish list. Since the problems of a pandemic, long-term electrical outage, or other collapse situation would be so vastly different from normal operations and hard for people to imagine, the best way to plan for it is not to hold a meeting, but to participate in a business strategy war game. Business war games are the, are the ideal way to stress test new product development and strategic plans, and the best way to get insights on how to deal with pending threats you've not faced before. These are pictures of a war game we ran in January 2017 where participants dealt with disruptions from new Trump administration international trade policies and a likely trade war, followed later in the war game by disruption in international shipping from a pandemic. It is possible to actually profit from a collapse if your organization is prepared and can swiftly switch to offer products and services needed for recovery. You can also do hedging and investments that can profit when the vast majority of companies are shut down and taking huge losses. While the ability to keep operating or recover faster than competitors can yield huge payoffs, we've also helped companies design business survival plans, not just business continuity plans. It's hard for some to accept, but in some scenarios, you are better off shutting down, securing your plant with a program in place to safeguard your assets and protecting your people. Throwing up your hands and saying, we can't prepare for such horrible disasters is intellectually incorrect and irresponsible. There are sensible, low-cost measures that you can take to secure your facilities and personnel. Indeed, it's generally easier than trying to keep operations going during a severe disruptive threat, and it's easier than trying to keep your complex IT systems safe from cyber attack. Contact us for more information or questions on issues covered in this briefing or to request a copy of our white paper on cost-effective risk assessment and mitigation.